So let's dive in. Uh, first, you might be asking yourself, well, gosh, what the heck is an ocean world? Well, Earth counts, right? We are a world and we have oceans. That's awesome. But what we're finding is that in the other parts of the solar system, Earth is the exception and not the rule. Uh, most of these other ocean worlds I'll be telling you about today, instead of having that water on their surfaces, they tend to have it underneath a shell of ice. Now, sometimes that interior subsurface liquid water ocean is in contact with the, the rocky insides of that moon. They're, these are usually moons. Uh, sometimes there's another layer of what we call high pressure ice that's denser than water and actually sinks um, down at the, the base of that seafloor. And we'll talk a little bit about what that could mean for whether or not these oceans could host life. Um, but if there's one thing I want you to take from this entire experience this evening, it's that there are a lot of these worlds out there. Uh, these are just a handful. They're actually a lot more than I could even include on this slide. Uh, these are just a few moons around uh, some of our gas and ice giants, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. Uh, but there could even be liquid water oceans within places like Pluto. Uh, that's a possibility as well. And so I'd like you to keep in mind, as we're just touching on three of these places tonight, um, that there are a lot of diverse worlds to explore that seem to have the conditions for life as we know it, uh, liquid water, chemical building blocks, and an energy source. Uh, so let's uh, go right in and let's zoom over to Jupiter first. So we've started on Earth. We have gone four more astronomical units away from the sun. An astronomical unit, of course, is the distance between Earth and the sun. That's one AU. We've done that uh, four more times to get out to Jupiter. Space is big. Uh, this is one of my favorite images that the uh, Juno spacecraft took fairly recently of Jupiter, which is a beautiful world. But I have to say I'm a bit biased. While Jupiter is great, it's moon Europa is what really captures my focus, my attention. This is what Europa looks like. Uh, you may notice that its surface has a lot of cracks on it. Uh, that's really cool and very exciting for us. But you may also notice one other thing. It doesn't have a lot of craters. This tells us that Europa's surface is relatively young because uh, typically if something has more craters, it's been around longer in the solar system. Uh, and so that's one of the things that gets us really excited about Europa because we think that the surface is being regenerated over time, uh, potentially through exchange with its liquid water ocean. Uh, so Europa has an ice crust. Underneath that is a ton of liquid water. It's a global ocean, so that icy crust is actually floating uh, and it's decoupled. It's not connected uh, to the rocky interior of Europa. And the cool thing about Europa is that even though it's a bit smaller than Earth, it's about the size of our moon, actually, Earth's moon, it has more liquid water than all of Earth's oceans combined, about two to three times as much, uh, depending on which model you believe. That's a lot of water, uh, which is pretty exciting from a habitability perspective. That means uh, looking for conditions where life could exist today, as opposed to a place like Mars, where it's much more probable that life may have existed in the past, um, but it's pretty inhospitable, at least on the surface there today. Now, what the heck is keeping that water liquid? Why isn't it frozen solid? Well, as it turns out, uh, Europa's orbit around Jupiter is not perfectly circular. That means sometimes it's closer to Jupiter, sometimes it's further away. And because of that, it experiences what we call tidal flexing. Basically, the whole moon sort of stretches and compresses as it goes around its orbit uh, of about three and a half days. And that flexing creates heat. And we think that's one of the reasons why this liquid water has stayed liquid for so long. Now, what this gets us excited about is not only does it keep that liquid um, from freezing, but it also opens up this potential for something called hydrothermal vents. Now, I wish this video was of the ocean of Europa. Maybe one day we'll get there. Uh, this is actually on in Earth's ocean at our sea floor. Uh, what you're looking at here are these beautiful chimneys that form when water it gets heated up by Earth's mantle and then spat back out into the very cold ocean waters. 
the the hot water picks up minerals and then those precipitate out, they crash out and form these gorgeous chimneys that are very energy rich because they give you a lot of gradients, um, temperature, concentration, uh, all sorts of things that certain organisms can take advantage of to survive. And what you may notice in that video is that it wasn't just microorganisms that you could see there. You could see crabs, you know, tube worms, octopods, all sorts of organisms living in harmony. And as far removed from sunlight as you can get, at least here on Earth. Instead, these communities subsist off of geothermal energy or hydrothermal energy. So energy from the warmth of the Earth. And we think that those kinds of systems, if they're is an ecosystem alive and thriving in Europa's ocean, it might use similar energy sources because of that geothermal heating. And so we're really interested in understanding what's in that ocean, uh, but it's not just what's in the ocean that is important for us. It's how any of those uh, biosignature molecules or evidence of life get transported up to the surface. Um, Europa's ice shell is on the order of like tens of kilometers thick, so multiple miles to tens of miles thick. That's a lot of ice, uh, but there are ways that material from that ocean could get up to the surface and be detectable uh, by a future mission without the need to dig or drill. And that gets us to a mission that we have built that is sitting at Kennedy Space Center in Florida right now and is going to launch in about a month and a half. It's called Europa Clipper uh, because it's like a clipper ship. Uh, it has a bunch of instruments on board. Uh, that's where the similarities end. It doesn't have sails like a, a clipper ship does, although it does have very large solar panels, which you can see here. Those are what give this spacecraft its power. Uh, it's got a tremendously powerful payload able to take what we call remote sensing as well as in situ measurements. So this is a, an artist rendering of what it would look like during one of our flybys. You can see Jupiter in the background, but again, Jupiter's gorgeous, not our primary focus for this mission. You're about to see Europa come into view. Now, the payload of Europa Clipper is meant to understand um, what kind of ice we have here. There are different types of ice. You can have crystalline versus amorphous. That tells us how it might have been processed or how it might have formed. Uh, also, those dark brown patches, we think that those could either be organics or certain types of salts. We're not sure yet based on the data we have right now. Uh, the Europa Clipper Pale will be able to tell us for sure, as well as looking for and characterizing um, organic molecules and other signatures of what we call habitability to really understand if this ocean is suitable for life as we know it. And so this... Uh, this incredible spacecraft has a lot of different instruments on board. Um, some of them are meant to collect images, like the Europa Imaging System, which we call ICE. Get it? ICE? Because we're looking at ICE. It's so funny. Um, we also have uh, things that can map the composition. MISE is a, what we call an imaging spectrometer. So for every pixel of a photo that it takes, it gets a full spectrum from visible down into uh, the near infrared. That can help us identify salts and organic molecules. We can also look for hot spots with our thermal imager. We'll be able to basically stick out our tongue and catch snowflakes. Any dust or ice grains that have been uh, propelled off the surface can be analyzed by SUDA, as well as the gas, any gas molecules in Europa's tenuous exosphere, we will be able to analyze with mass specs. We've also got ways of looking at composition of that exosphere, uh, as well as potential plumes on Europa with our UV instrument. And then we have uh, ways to be able to seek underneath that ice shell and get constraints on the thickness of that ice shell, as well as the ocean with our radar. We also have plasma instruments that will help us get an idea of the radiation environment and what kind of ions are around. Uh, and we'll be able to supplement that with our magnetometer, which is on this giant boom. Now, why do we have this boom? Well, this is a great uh, simulation showing all of the sources of magnetic noise uh, that we have just with the instruments and other electronics on our spacecraft. Those can distort our signal. And so that's why we have to stick that particular instrument way, way out on the special boom that's going to, to um, deploy after launch. 
So if you'd like to learn more, go to europa.nasa.gov. We actually have a clipper cam that shows a live feed of the spacecraft sitting at Kennedy Space Center. We've been doing a couple of tests to make sure everything's good to go before we button it up, uh, stick it on the rocket, and send it off into space. Okay, so that's Europa. That was five astronomical units out. Now we're going to double that. We're going to go out to 10 AU. Again, space is big. Uh, to get to another gorgeous gas giant called Saturn. I was very lucky to be part of the Cassini mission that studied Saturn, its rings, and its moons for, gosh, 13 years. Uh, this is one of my favorite images that Cassini took of Saturn. Um, this is another one, and this is two scale. You can see Saturn as well as its largest moon, uh, which I hope you can see right here. Uh, let's zoom in on that moon. This is Titan, and this is how it looks in the visible. Uh, for those of you that live or have lived in Los Angeles like I do right now, you're familiar with haze. That's basically what this is. It's got uh, multiple haze layers formed from uh, radiation from the sun, breaking up molecules and making more complex ones. Uh, we did have instruments on Cassini to look through that haze layer. And when we did, we saw this gorgeous surface, just like Europa, it's made out of water ice, but Titan is so different. Um, it actually has liquid on its surface. Uh, this is one of my favorite images that Cassini took. This is in the infrared. And what you can see is a glint of sunlight up here off of a very smooth surface on Titan's North Pole. It turns out it's so smooth, it has to be liquid. This is a liquid lake at the North Pole of Titan, but it's way too cold for water to be a liquid here. Titan's surface temperature is 90 Kelvin, which is about minus 183 degrees C. I don't know exactly what it is in Fahrenheit because I'm a scientist. We don't work in Fahrenheit, but it's really, really cold. So it turns out that liquid is actually liquid methane and ethane. Uh, when I give talks to elementary schools, I talk about liquid farts, but I've, I've come to realize everyone loves a good joke. So yes, there are liquid farts on Titan. Uh, and that's what makes it such a fascinating place from an astrobiology perspective, because in some ways it's very similar to Earth. And yet in other ways, it's so different. It's got clouds, just like Earth does, except they're made out of different stuff, methane, ethane, and probably some other crazy molecules like hydrogen cyanide and benzene. Uh, this methane and ethane forms rain and forms rivers that carve channels in its surface. Again, they look like river channels here on Earth, but they're made out of really different stuff. And these uh, rivers pool in these beautiful lakes, like I mentioned at the poles. And these are not small lakes. These are big, like bigger than some of our Great Lakes here in the U.S., uh, made out of different stuff. Titan also has dunes. We think they're made out of organic molecules instead of silica sand like they are here on Earth. And so if we look at Titan as a system, it's got these echoes of familiar landforms that we have here on Earth but they're made out of different materials. And as a chemist, this gets me super excited because I can replicate these things in the lab and try to figure out, could these be suitable for life as we know it or life as we don't know it? Let's say that you're standing at the shore of a Titan Lake. This is liquid methane and ethane, a non-polar solvent. It's totally the opposite of water. It's like oil and water, right? This is more similar to oil. It's non-polar. That means any microbe or any fish swimming around in this lake would have to be fundamentally made of very different stuff than any sort of Earth life. Boy, wouldn't it be amazing to go and explore this world and see what it's made of? Well, happily, we are. We are building a spacecraft that is actually an eight-bladed helicopter called Dragonfly. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it's about the same size as the big Mars rovers like Perseverance, except instead of wheels, it has uh, these helicopter blades as a way to move around. And this is because on Titan, the gravity is less than Earth and the atmosphere is thicker. It's actually one and a half times denser than Earth's atmosphere. And so that means even if you were standing on the surface of Titan and you had wings and you flapped them, you could fly. It's much more efficient to do these flying hops than it would be to drive like a traditional rover does. And we've been able to take advantage of lots of developments in uh, machine learning and AI and auto navigation from drone technology to be able to do this uh, completely autonomously on this alien world. So Dragonfly is launching in 2028. It's arriving at Saturn um, and landing on Titan in 2034. Remember, space is big. 
Um, once it does, it's going to operate for at least two years. We're hoping more. Uh, this is not solar powered. Instead, it's got an RTG, a radioisotope uh, thermoelectric generator. This is the same power supply that uh, Voyager, that Perseverance uses. A lot of our spacecraft, Cassini, also use this. Uh, so that means we'll have lots of time on the surface. And we've got a whole bunch of instruments to be able to uh, measure and understand the complex organic uh, tapestry that Titan is made out of. It's going to be a really, really exciting uh, set of measurements. Every time we land, we're going to deploy this drill you can see here. And then we're going to take advantage of the fact that Titan has a thick atmosphere. We basically have a fancy vacuum cleaner. That's how we're going to suck the sample up into our sample carousel. And from there, we're going to fire lasers at it. And we're also going to heat it up to be able to look at the organic molecules that are present there. Some of the tests that we have on board of Dragonfly will be able to look for molecules that life uses, life as we know it, things like fatty acids like you saw there, as well as uh, molecules like amino acids that uh, whether we have a wild form of life or life as we know it, it's quite possible that any sort of organism might use those types of amino acids. Here you're seeing a test for what's called chirality, which is a way to determine if those amino acids have been affected by life or not. So a lot of very exciting measurements that will be made with this mission. If you'd like to learn more, just Google NASA Dragonfly. Uh, the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab is building this, but in collaboration funded through NASA and with collaboration of a lot of NASA scientists and engineers uh, like me. So Titan is fascinating, but it's not the only amazing world that uh, is in orbit around Saturn. This is one of my other favorite images that Cassini took of a different moon. This one's called Enceladus. Now, this is a relatively tiny moon. It's about the size of the state of Arizona. But small things can be mighty. I'm a short person. I'm 5'2", so I totally understand that small things can be mighty. And here you are seeing a plume of material that Enceladus is spewing out into space from its south pole. If we zoom in a little bit closer, uh, you can see that there are massive cracks in Enceladus's ice shell. We call these four large ones the tiger stripes because it looks like a tiger went like that and just did a massive swipe of Enceladus's south pole. And that's where this material is emerging, forming a plume that's made up of gas molecules as well as ice grains that used to be water droplets, but they freeze when they get into the vacuum of space. These water droplets, as well as those gases, are sourced from Enceladus's liquid water ocean, just like Europa and just like Titan. I didn't mention it. Titan also has a liquid water ocean deep underneath its ice shell. But here at Enceladus, that liquid water ocean is accessible. It's being sprayed out into space. It's basically the universe's way of saying, hey, NASA, are you interested in finding out if this ocean has life in it? Come on by, free sample. And this was something that was discovered by Cassini. And Cassini was able to fly through this plume multiple times, but it was not designed to be a life search mission. So we got some tantalizing data uh, from Cassini that told us that Enceladus seems to have all the ingredients for life as we know it, but its instruments were not sensitive or powerful enough to actually look for that life itself. A follow-on mission would have to do that. Now let's take a closer look at these tiger stripes. They are these massive cracks. They're about three marathons long, about 120 kilometers long. Uh, and they are in ice that is probably about three kilometers deep before you hit water. Although water can actually fill the majority of that crack based on hydrostatic pressure. Um, the current models we have for how the Enceladus plume forms, we have a couple of different ways this could happen. Those cracks could be five meters wide, and it's just a straight shot right down to the liquid, um, which would be great for us. Or it could be similar to volcanic eruptions here on Earth, where you have a nozzle, you have a choke point that could be on the order of tens of centimeters. So about, you know, yay big, if you can see my face, about yay big in diameter. And so we at JPL like to dare mighty things, and we were thinking about how we might design something that could move against those plume forces, go down that crack, and be able to get through a constrained choke point like that. 
And so we came up with this idea. And since we live in LA, of course, we have access to some amazing animators. And an animator who worked on one of the Avengers movies actually helped to make this for us. Uh, this is EELS, which is it stands for Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor. It's a, basically a snake robot that is designed to be able to go over, around, uh, and through a lot of challenging terrains, those hard-to-reach places that rovers can't quite reach. Uh, the idea is that uh, to be able to move across the surface of Enceladus or down into those cracks, we have a lot of different terrain types that we have to deal with. And it turns out that a snake-like robot is able to adopt a lot of different gates to be able to deal with all of those different terrain types. And so these are animations, but let me show you the real thing, because I've been fortunate enough to be science lead for the team that actually built this. Um, this is what we call uh, version 1.0. Uh, here you can see us testing it at the Pasadena ice rink at like five in the morning. Uh, they actually let us go and test it on some ice there, as well as doing some preliminary tests here in our Mars yard at JPL, where we test our Mars rovers. We wanted to see how it would handle in what we call unconsolidated media, so really loose sand, how it could get over rocks and other obstacles. But all of this was in preparation for the actual test, which was a field campaign. Uh, we went last September to Canada uh, to Athabasca Glacier, uh, which we felt was the perfect analog environment, or at least as close of an analog as you can get here on Earth, to an ocean world like Enceladus. This allowed us to be able to test both how our robot moved horizontally across the surface, as well as vertically within some of these crevasses and moulins that you'll see in a moment. Uh, we also were able to see how it, how it was able to interact with realistic ice. Uh, real ice in the real world has contaminants in it. It's got different morphologies that are challenging to replicate in a lab. Or at least in a lab, you can do things in a more controlled way. We wanted to see how just uh, natural um, effects could change how that ice excuse me, how that ice could form and behave. Um, and we also did some tests of some of the composition of the various melt pools while we were there to be able to contribute to earth science. Because a lot of what NASA does is not just studying other worlds. We also study our home here, the earth. About a third of what NASA does is earth science. And so that's me. Um, I got to, to rappel down into some of these to scope them out uh, before we sent the, the robot in. It was a really incredible environment. <laughs> Excuse me. This was a wonderful place um, with a lot of uh, different, um, different, <clears throat> excuse me, one more time. There we go. A lot of different widths of um, crevasses and moulins that let us test a lot of different aspects of our robot. The other nice thing about Athabasca was that we had very easy logistical access. Uh, we had these giant buses that Jasper uh, National Park was able to uh, let us use to be able to bring a lot of our equipment and our gear. Some of our robots are, you know, on the order of like 200 pounds. So they're pretty heavy. Uh, we did have to do some heli drops, but a lot of the, the things that we transported, we were able to do on those buses. This allowed us to also bring out a pretty large team, which was great for being able to run multiple tests at the same time. Uh, some of those tests here, you can see us testing our horizontal mobility. So just moving along the surface, uh, EELS is able to autonomously navigate. It has a bunch of imagers as well as a LIDAR, which is basically a way of uh, firing lasers and seeing how those lasers bounce off to create a 3D map of its environment. And you can see us testing out a lot of different sidewinding and other gates here. The vertical mobility test was a bit more challenging. It required a lot of setup, which you can see here. Uh, some of these moulins, they go down to the bottom of this glacier, which is hundreds of meters deep. And if you drop something, you've lost it. Like you just, you can't rappel down and go and retrieve it. It's too dangerous. And so we rigged up our robots to make sure that uh, we could recover them if they slipped and fell a little bit, uh, that they wouldn't be the end, we wouldn't lose the robot. Um, so what you can see here is we we kept a lot of ropes and rigging, but when we actually did the horizontal mobility tests, those lines were slack and we were actually able to move our robot up and down uh, on the slippery ice. You can see there's a lot of meltwater happening because this was September. Um, so it was a really successful test 
uh, as well, we designed and built an instrument. This is an instrument that is meant to look at positively and negatively charged ions in liquid. It's meant to be able to fit in one module of the EELS robot. Uh, we operated it independently, so we could do some tests while they were doing the mobility test. Um, but it was a great way to be able to prove that there are all sorts of payloads that could be accommodated on a robot like this. Um, this is another artist concept showing what a version of EELS might look like on the surface of Enceladus one day. And I want to leave you with a quote from Carl Sagan uh, that I think really motivates why it's so important to be able to move on these alien surfaces. Uh, Carl, of course, uh, worked on the Viking rovers as, in, as well as was an inspiration for many of our planetary science missions like Voyager. And the two Viking landers were immobile. They weren't able to move. And back then, he spoke of being incredibly frustrated with not being able to, you know, look under that rock or go on your tiptoes and see just a little bit further how limiting it was to be stationary. And so that's one of the things that drives us to develop these new robotic architectures so that we can get to those interesting and hard to reach places. With that, I'd like to thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, of course, the things that I've spoken of required massive, massive teams, many more names than I could mention here. Um, and so a giant thanks to them and a thanks to you for your attention. And with that, I'm more than happy to take questions.